Dear colleague, good afternoon. This is the last session of the Apostle COVID-19 webinar. But today we have a lecture from outside that Professor Antonio Bertolini from Singapore. Professor Antonio Bertolini is Professor Duke News Medical School, Division Emerging Infectious Diseases, Singapore. So, I am Professor Mana and Professor Khadir Dogmeci from Turkey will chair the session. So now we would like to ask Professor Antonia Bortelli to start with your presentation, please. Yes. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to present some uh, immunological data related to COVID-19. Um, the, the title of my talk is Understanding Cytokine Storm in COVID-19. I will initially speak uh, about, let's say, the, the, the general immunology of uh, this new infection. Uh, clearly, as I think most of you know, I mean, I'm not really an expert of, uh, of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. I start to work on it now. Uh, but, you know, uh, most of the data that I will present are data that I found in the literature. Um, okay, these are my actually conflict of interest that has nothing to do in reality with COVID-19, but more on hepatitis B where I'm working. So this is the summary of what uh, I'm gonna talk to you today. I will do a very brief introduction related to the virological feature of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Then again, I'll sort of, let's say, overview of the antiviral immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And then I will go and we will discuss together the mechanism of cytokines related store. Uh, and in particular, I will make uh, some of uh, some points about the differences that exist between uh, the cytokines related storm in CAR T cell therapy and during SARS CoV 2 infection. So let's start from uh, just a small <coughs> introduction related to SARS CoV 2. It's uh, a coronavirus, and I will say I want to stress that it's a real big virus. Uh, just to let you know, this uh, sort of, let's say, 10,000 amino acid proteome, most of the study now have been really focused on spike, that is this protein, and on other structural protein. All this other region, the ORF1, that is this big region, contain basically 16 non-structural proteins that are extremely important for the replication of the virus. They making a replicase complex and there are also proteins that are modulating innate immunity. And again, this is important to remember, particularly in relation to the fact that, you know, cytokine storm is due to, again, pro-inflammatory events. And it's clear that the virus is doing something to try to inhibit some of the antiviral response of the innate immunity. So other thing about uh, the COVID-19, uh, again, yes, is a positive sing single-stranded RNA virus. It belongs to the family of the beta coronavirus. And there are other two human beta coronaviruses. One is the SARS-CoV, which is uh, the etiological agent of SARS, and MERS, that is the etiological uh, agent of MERS. There are some similarities. And then again, there is this important spike that is actually the uh, protein that is binding to the receptor, the AC2 receptor, that is present in the cells that can be infected by the virus. Uh, let me go again instead of, on a sort of, let's say, general overview of the antiviral immunity. And this, I use usually these slides just to remind you that we have too many, too main components of the antiviral immunity, the innate and the adaptive. The innate is important for what we call an early viral containment, but it's also important for the maturation of the adaptive immunity. And basically the components of the innate immunity are the ability of cells that are infected to recognize what we call PAMP, that is pathogen associated molecular uh, pattern, in our case RNA and let's say get activated and induce interferon that can block viral replication. 
These cytokines, mainly interferon alpha, but also IL-6, IL-1, or IL-12, are important because then they are able to activate dendritic cells and also NK cells. NK cells are important because they can release cytokines that have antiviral effect, but can also potentially lyse the infected cells. The dendritic cells that are activated, they are then able to mature and, uh, let's say, expand the adaptive immunity. Adaptive immunity that consists of B cells that are producing antibody, T helper cells that are helping the production of antibody, but also help the clonal expansion of cytotoxicity cells. Cytotoxicity cells that ultimately are also the cells that are recognizing virus infected cells and they lyse them. Okay. What we know about all these components in uh, SARS-CoV-2? Well, I would say at the moment still very, very little. Um, going through the literature and going also, we say, through the literature of SARS uh, and not only of SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, the, the information are not really, are still at the infancy, even though a large quantity of work has already been started. So what we can say, NK cells, yes, we see that NK cells are reducing number in patients with COVID-19 in severe cases. Also the lymphocytes are reduced. There have been really just a couple of weeks ago, some uh, papers that have demonstrated that during COVID-19, there is induction of SARS-specific antigen-specific T cells. And at the same time, we know that the B cells are induced. We know much more at the moment about antibody and B cells because most of the work are really going on understanding how we can block basically the interaction between the virus and the receptor. Well, I would say that one other thing about important for the S2 receptor is, is anatomical distribution that somehow tell us what is the real tropism of the virus. And mainly this uh, S2 is presented clearly on the ciliate cells of the upper respiratory uh, tract. They are present on alveolar macrophages and this clearly explains why the lungs is one of the organs that is much more targeted by uh, this infection. That is also present in enterocytes and this explains why also RNA of the virus can be found in the feces and also in cholangiocytes. That is not been, let's say, seen to, to be presented instead in hepatocytes. I forgot to uh, put here that also the kidney cells have ACE2 receptor. And now there start to be some data that are suggesting that there is also a kidney uh, components in the COVID-19. But let me go back to the antibody now. And again, there are antibody that are specific for spike proteins that are not known to neutralize the uh, virus. And therefore, they are protected. We also know that neutralizing antibody against uh, this region, a particular region of the spike proteins that is binding to the receptor are actually being identified in the patients that are resolving the infection. Uh, and this, this is why also the serum of the patients now that have been uh, able to control the virus is used for potential therapy. Okay, now another point that I think is interesting, which is something that we start to know, is the kinetics of the B cell response in COVID-19. Here in reality, the first figure that I'm showing is not the kinetics of the SARS-CoV-2, it's not the kinetics of the COVID, but is the kinetics of the antibody that were present in patients with SARS. And here it just shows that antibody, neutralizing antibody in SARS, they are really at the peak around 60, 90 days after infection, but then they start to go down after a couple of years. I would say that this is something that I've done directly. The T cell response instead in SARS patients can last much longer. So I would say that we have quite good data that the infection with SARS or let's say with beta coronaviruses are able to induce actually quite a good memory response, which can actually be an important point for the question of whether people could be reinfected. And there is actually one paper that just came out yesterday in science that actually demonstrates that monkeys that were infected with uh, the virus are, at, and then they clear, they are actually protected for a secondary infection, which is an important point. Then here I'm putting instead the kinetics of antibody production during the 
infection of, uh, with COVID-19, with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So you can see that the virus is actually start to replicate and is basically able to replicate without symptoms at the beginning and also without antibodies. So this is really the real critical part when the virus can spread. And usually we have seen in some data that are appearing really recently in the literature that the antibody start to be produced at around two, three weeks after symptoms of the patient. And therefore, I would say this is important, there is a window when the antibody and the SARS-CoV-2 messenger RNA coexist, which is here. So there's, at the moment, we don't have any data that are showing that when we have antibody, the virus is completely eliminated. There is quite a long period, that is about 10 days, when the antibody and the messenger RNA coexist. Okay, now let's go to really the early inflammatory events that are much more related to the issue of the cytokines release syndrome, which is one of the characteristic, or at least this is what has been said, is one of the characteristic of what's happening in COVID-19 patients. And what's happening basically when a virus infects, uh, uh, when SARS-CoV-2 infect uh, is target, let's say a CD8 cells of the upper respiratory uh, system. Well, the virus can be recognized. It can be recognized and basically, again, the pattern recognition receptor, they are able to recognize single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA, RNA, which are these pattern recognition receptors. Like all, we say, the, 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 the RNA viruses, mainly they are recognized by TLR3, TLR7, and TLR8 that are present in the endosome, but they can also be recognized by RIGAI, that is instead recognizing foreign RNA that is present in the cytosome. So basically these are probably, and I have to say probably because there are still not a large quantity of study, um, these are probably the uh, pattern recognition receptors that are able to test and understand whether the virus starts to replicate. When this RIGA is activated, it is activating the classical interferon-related genes that are the ones that they are causing the production of type 1 interferon, so interferon alpha, and interferon lambda. Some data are telling us that the SARS-CoV-2 seems to activate and to produce mainly, actually to activate the production of interferon lambda. Not at a high dose, however, not a very large quantity of uh, interferon is produced. Instead, you can really see again in vitro that there is a production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, I6 and I1. We know also that the SARS-CoV-2 is sensitive to interferon lambda. So the little interferon lambda that is produced and is triggered by the infection can actually go to other cells and sort of, let's say, induce an antiviral state. Uh, but again, I want to stress that at the moment, the data are suggesting that the quantity of interferon that is activated during this uh, infection, during SARS-CoV-2 infection, is mean. And why is that? And I try to explain this in this slide. Well, here I'm going back to this big ORF1 uh, genes that cover basically two-thirds of the genes of the virus. And all these uh, proteins are probably able to suppress interferon uh, signal. Uh, the evidence that we have at the moment is that, therefore, we know already that SARS-CoV-1, so the etiological agent of SARS, was actually to, able to suppress interferon release. We, have, we can see now that there is a lack of robust interferon signature in SARS-CoV-2 infected cell lines. And again, we start to see that in patients, and here we are going towards, let's say again, the cytokine storm, uh, we have this idea that we, there are data that are showing that patients with severe COVID-19, they have low interference gamma signature, but they have much more high inflammatory uh, uh, the, uh, production. And this is probably due to this multiple mechanism of inhibition 
that are likely related to these non-structural proteins that are encoded by this ORF1. And here I listed some example. It seems that there is this non-structural protein 15 that can alter the recognition of RNA by MDFA5, which is this that is helping basically the activation of RIGAI. It's part again of the pattern recognition receptor for uh, RNA viruses. We have also other data that are showing that non-structural protein 1 can directly inhibit activation of STAT1, classical interferon genes. And we have other data that are showing that another non-structural protein can increase the degradation of this interferon alpha uh, receptor. So therefore, I mean, the data really suggest that the virus is able to dysregulate the interferon type 1 response, but cause more inflammation. <coughs> Sorry. And now let's go to my final three, four slides about really what is a cytokine release syndrome. And for cytokine release syndrome, sorry, <coughs> we intend a, a severe systemic inflammatory response that occurred due to the large and uncontrolled release of inflammatory cytokines. And this again has been mainly associated on what? With infection or with therapy like TCR T-cell therapy or CAR T-cell therapy. The clinical features are fever, hypotension, capillary leak, coagulation, severe organ dysfunction, and neurotoxicity. These are the clinical features of the cytokine release syndrome with CAR T cell therapy, due to CAR T cell therapy. And is characterized by elevated level of cytokines, mainly TNF, IL-6, and IL-1. Now, what could be the mechanism? Well, the mechanism here for when we have uh, uh, the cytokine release syndrome during infection are again are mediated directly by the ability of the pathogen associated molecular pattern to recognize the RNA genomes. This leads to the activation of the monocytes. The monocytes produce IL-1 and IL-6, and this IL-1, IL-6, and other chemokines are increasing the recruitment of more inflammatory cells and T cells. The T cells could recognize the infected cells, and this sort of circuit starts again. And this could cause a sort of constant inflammatory events without a control of infected cells. This is what we are thinking could happen during infection, I would say, and therefore probably during SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, the mechanism of cytokine storm instead, the classical cytokine storm that is present during TCR T-cell or CAR T-cell therapy, they are actually due to a completely different mechanism because here the mechanism of release of cytokines result is the result of the fact that the CAR T cells that are introduced in the body of the patients in large number are recognizing the target. And this activation, the activation of the CAR T cell, lead to the release of TNF alpha and interferon gamma, and then the activation of inflammatory monocytes. This TNF alpha interferon gamma activation is clearly proportional to the quantity of targets and CAR T cells. So during CAR T cell therapy, we introduce large number of antigen specific T cells that, for example, can lyse all the B cells. And this cle clearly causes a real cytokine storm. Let me go now to the number and let's go to the differences that actually exist between the COVID 19. Uh, um, cytokine storm and the one that is instead caused by CAR T cell therapy. There are some clinical differences. There is, for example, in the COVID-19 patient, there is no hypotension, there is no capillary leak, and there is no neurotoxicity. But then again, I was checking the quantity, the serum IL-6, for example, that is one of the cytokines that is more increasing the COVID-19, is level are much lower as compared to what we found in patients that are going during TCR therapy. This is one example. These are the classical cytokine storm in CAR T cell therapy. You can see that the level of cytokines are around 10,000 picogram per ml. The peak of cytokines level that is found in COVID-19 is no more than 100 and 200. So you can see that you know, the cytokine storm in CAR T cell therapy is really has a much higher level of pro-inflammatory cytokines 
And this was also again seen in another paper that was published in Lancet a uh, uh, few months, one month ago. And again, you can see that all the pro-inflammatory cytokines, yes, they are elevated, they are elevated in patients with severe disease, but the cytokines concentration are several folds lower than in the cytokine st storm that is caused by CAR T cell infusion. Uh, one last point, what we have, what are the level of cytokines when we found in SARS patients that don't have to, to remind you are also patients that they got severe lung uh, problems with uh, severe lung disease. Also in this, there are cytokines that are increasing and actually the level of cytokines in SARS patients was much higher than what we found in COVID-19. Again, here we are about 1,000 uh, picogram per ml of cytokine. So there is basically a hierarchy of production of cytokines in these, these three different pa uh, pathologies. So in conclusion, again, I hope I give you an understanding of the general immunopathology of SARS-CoV-2 infection. But I have to say that this, our knowledge are really at the infancy. We really still don't know a lot. Uh, we know that SARS-CoV-2 activates in, in innate immunity, but for example, the interferon signature is clearly not very high. There is more an inflammatory signature. And this lack of interferon production probably just is an indication that the virus is able to inhibit inter type 1 interferon uh, antiviral effect. So uh, my last point is that inflammatory cytokines are definitely produced in COVID-19 patients, but their level is much lower than what has been detected in CAR T cell therapy and in SAR patients. Therefore, somehow I'm finishing with this sort of provocative idea that say, but do, can we really talk about uh, cytokines release syndrome in COVID-19 patients? It seems to me that it's more a classical inflammatory cytokines, yes, uh, uh, increase that is present in many viral diseases. And I'm gonna finish here. I will be happy to have some of your questions. And I want to thank some of my <coughs> laboratory people my, that are working with me that they helped me to do these slides. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Antonio, this is uh, uh, to Dr. Lesmana. I have sent some questions. Maybe uh, you can answer. Aha, but I don't find it where I can see them. Uh, <laughs> I can be, uh, read out. Uh, my question is, if yes, permitted, please. I should send it to moderator, not me directly. So, but I can speak in the interest of time. Uh, what is the relation between interferon lambda versus type 1 interferon in, in, uh, in the context of uh, COVID? Well, <sighs> So, I mean, I, I was just quoting uh, some data uh, where they are infecting uh, uh, cell lines in vitro, and they were find out that the interferon lambda was the one more produced, more than the interferon alpha and interferon uh, beta. So now, just uh, the type one interferon usually is alpha. Usually, uh, interferon uh, type one interferon is interferon alpha and interferon beta. Interferon lambda is, is called type three interferon. Uh, it seems to have a very actually also good antiviral effect in vitro against this. And I think there are actually attempts now to use interferon lambda as a potential therapy. There is some discussion about it. That's the only things that I know. Uh, people are also uh, looking into the interferon beta as a therapy. And also, I wanted to know uh, what is the relation between organ failure and the cytokine release syndrome? Uh, which of the cytokines you think are more damaging to the organs, uh, especially uh, kidney and uh, heart? 
Uh, you see, Professor Salin, I mean, looking at what's going on now, I mean, I think nobody, nobody knows what is the pathogenesis of these uh, diseases. And really, I, I mean, I was shocked in a way to find out that the level of inflammatory cytokines, in reality, even though it's increased, is not so high. So in a way, the general idea that are the cytokines that are inducing organ damage, I don't think is really something that we can support at the moment. Because you see, also uh, there are clinical even differences between uh, what's happening after CAR T cell therapy. In CAR T cell therapy, there is clearly neurotoxicity. There is clearly hypotension which is probably really due to this large quantity of inflammatory cytokines. In the COVID-19, even though it is true that IL-6 and IL-1 are increased, but to be honest, they are increased to levels that are similar than other viral infections that cause symptoms. So I really don't think that the cytokines themselves are the cause of the organ damage in organs where we are not able to demonstrate the infection. Antonio, this is a very interesting point. I think this is not in accordance to the, um, the general understandings, but I think it, it make, you make your point uh, because you have this uh, CAR T experience and the cytokine levels uh, is much higher and is, I suppose it's not causing the organ uh, damage uh, seen in the COVID-2. Uh, my my question. I have a questions for you about the antibody that you mentioned. So the IgM uh, uh, increases, and then the, with the declines of the uh, virus, uh, there is an overlapping uh, uh, time zone. Uh, what type of antibody you are testing? What is the antigen so you are testing? Uh, because we have uh, lots of um, uh, issues around here. Everybody wants to get the antibody. What? what antibody assay and what is the antigens you are talking about when you talk about the IgM? Yes, now this is a very good question, uh, George. And, and, and I found also myself sometime in a complete confusion about this. Uh, so le let me tell you a couple of things. So mainly the tests have been done to uh, test a neutralizing antibody, which however are clearly one antibody that is only specific for this part of spike protein that are binding to the S2 receptor. In reality, again, there was a paper, I think again, a couple of weeks ago, even less, where it showed that the kinetics of antibody against the different structural proteins, before I'm thinking about nucleocapsid, membrane, envelope, and spike, they are all starting, and they seem to start all at the same times. As far as concern, IgG, okay? For IgM, to be honest, I don't think we have data. But when, when I'm saying the antibody are starting, I think now we can say antibody against the different structural proteins are occurring. I don't think we have at the moment any clear data whether there is a difference in the kinetics of antibodies that are recognizing different parts of the virus. One other thing that I can tell you is that for example, in SARS, uh, it was clear that the neutralizing antibody was going down, and that at that point, the serum was not neutralizing anymore. But you still have in patients that got SARS uh, 20 years ago, basically, 17 years ago, you can still find some antibody against the nucleoprotein of the virus. A little bit like our core anti-core hepatitis B, you see? that is still present when you just get in contact with the virus. Probably is not uh, a, an antibody that is uh, as neutralizing activity, but is present and can give you whether you've been in contact with the virus. Thank you very much, Antonio. Okay. You're welcome. There are a number of other questions that have come from members of the, of the audience. Would you like me to share those? Yes. Also from Sydney. So I was, some of the questions that, one of them is, I would like to ask, is cytokine release syndrome comparable to the macrophage 
activation syndrome or hemophagocytic syndrome. So can you just explain a little bit more about the relationship between them? Oh my God, no, this is a too difficult question for me. I don't know. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, I, I'm back to the point, which I'm, I'm first, I would want to stress because I can see some of the, of the, of the questions. So I'm not going to, to answer directly to your question. I'm, I'm, but I'm really thinking that, for example, the, the general idea of using IL-6 as a therapy, I don't know. Looking at the quantity of cytokines that has been, uh, let's say, published in patients that have COVID-19 severe disease, it's really not so much. So I don't really think that this is uh, a therapy to go. To, to be honest, uh, again, I, I, I see this uh, again, production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, a sort of normal antiviral immunity. I can see this level of IL-6 in other viral disease where in reality we never talk about uh, cytokines release syndrome, okay? For the two pathology that you told me that now I even forgot, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I, I, I cannot give you a clear answer. No, so, I think you've triggered some thoughts and then people are saying, well, is that the secondary deaths that we see in the second or third week of infection that have been attributed to the cytokine storm, are they actually due to secondary events such as bacterial superinfection or other events? It could be. You see, I mean, it could also be because, you know, one other point which I'm interested to study is whether the second really uh, wave of pathology is actually due to the fact that then you start to have adaptive immunity with T cells that are really going and, and, and lies the infected cells. That's also something that we don't know, but which we'll be interested to study. So I think you have to answer the question from Nikolai Naumov is on there, on the Q&A section as well. Where is it? <laughs> He's on the Q&A. He says hi, for to start with. But then he says, recently significant cross-reactivity was reported at cytotoxic and helper T cells between SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2. Will this help to control SARS-CoV-2 infection? <laughs> Okay, so I, I do think uh, that, uh, I mean, there is no question that there are cross-reactivity between, uh, I would say, T cells that were able to recognize uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. And that's something actually that we are studying. Here, I think the big question is, uh, are the T cells important for protection or are the T cells important for pathology? Okay, so this is something that at the end of the day, we still don't know. I personally think that we have many data in animal model, but also in SARS patients that told us that when you have a good T cell response, they actually the disease was less severe. But in the SARS-CoV-2, in the COVID-19 patients, we still don't know. So again, I really think that here more the question of cross reactivity is correct. I do honestly think that in the general population, there could be a sort of cross reactivity against COVID-19. There is not only SARS, there are other coronaviruses that are causing normal cold uh, that can actually cross react with SARS-CoV-2. But whether these T cells will be protective or whether they will modulate the pathology, that's something that we still don't know. And it's clearly very important because it can even explain why the syndromes that you encounter in patients are so different. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, thank you. I might ask a couple more questions that have come to us from the audience and then head back to Professor Lesmana to moderate and then I'm going to give us a yeah, presentation. So I don't know if you can see the Q&A um, questions that have been put there. I see some. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> some they will say, oh, the audio is not very good, which I really regret. Uh, yeah. Now that's in the chat. There's a Q&A section as well. And there, there's a question from Dr. Effendi saying that we are trying to investigate the use of tocilizumab to treat severe COVID as we thought it was caused by an increase in IL-6 
do you think it's still reasonable should we try to find another candidate drug? And then there was another question about IL-1 blocker Anakinra as well. Hey, you, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I would say, I mean, people have to understand that I'm more a laboratory guy. Uh, and, and therefore it's difficult for me to, to answer this therapeutic question. Uh, but if I have to, let's say, just make uh, an assumption and see the level of IL-6 and IL-1 that I can see in the literature, because this is not something that I study, but something that I see in the literature. Again, the level of IL-6 and IL-1, yes, is increased, but is not even close to what we found in the CAR T cell therapy, where actually this therapy were useful. But I'm back to the point, in CAR T cell therapy, we have 10,000 picograms of IL-6. In the COVID-19, we got patients the, at the moment, I can see that the peak is 200. So it's a big difference. And for IL-1, it's the same. So I'm, I'm not convinced about this. That's my point. Based on what I can find in the literature related to the concentrations of these cytokines in the patients with severe COVID-19. Thank you. Professor Lesman, are you happy for us to close? Thank you very much. Yeah. Professor Sarin, you have another question? I don't know, I see. Oh. Okay. okay sure the uh, difference between the neutralizing antibody and uh, an IgG antibody, one, and second is how do you explain that when the IgG antibody is coming up, the virus is still surviving. So do you think there are different B cells which are involved? So how is it that the virus is still persisting and you have good antibody levels? So these are two questions, Antonio, only you can answer. <laughs> well, okay, so I mean, in, again, I think when we talk about IgG in general, you know, we, we don't specify the, 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 the antigen that are specific for. So at the moment, we know that the neutralizing antibody are the one that are recognized a particular region of the spike proteins, which is the spike protein that interact with S2 receptor. So, you know, why at the end of the day, we can see already antibodies, but the virus is still there? It could just be a question of quantity. You know, you can just see that the quantity of neutralizing antibody is not sufficient. Then there is, I think, one very important point here. Here we are talking about a virus that is infecting cells that are actually located towards the exterior of the body. If you're thinking there, we are talking about enterocytes, we are talking about ciliate cells, we are talking about alveolar macrophage that are actually inside, out, I would say, outside the body. So we measure serum. The serum is just an indirect quantification of the antibodies that will be secreted. Probably we will have to measure IgA, which are the antibodies that are secreted. But the localization of the virus is really in cells that are a loose contact with the circulation. And therefore, I think this dichotomy, in a way, we are studying everything now in the blood and in the serum, but the reality is that this virus is infecting cells that are just really just in contact with the circulatory uh, system and they are mainly revolved towards the exterior of the body because they want to go. Thank you. Excellent. It was, thank you for the question. Again, I'm, I'm really regretting about the, the sounds, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, shall we have uh, uh, Simon uh, to uh, show us the curve and then to follow by the Professor Dobercy? Thank you, George, and, and thank you very much, Antonio, for an absolutely beautiful talk. Uh, the COVID 
at the Parcel Task Force thought it would be very useful, as I mentioned last week, for those that joined us then, to share the experiences that we're seeing around the region in terms of the COVID cases, the COVID deaths, and then to, to really highlight one of the countries and the specific experiences there. And today we're going to learn about the experience in Turkey. I'd like to share here the deaths that the sorry the total number of confirmed COVID-19 cases of course these are confirmed so they are predicated by having tests that confirm the infection of what we are seeing around the region and you can see the very high numbers that we know about from particularly the non-region say so the United States Russia Brazil which is rapidly increasing and about to overtake Russia and the United Kingdom and Italy of course Below that are the cases that are emerging around the Asia region. And you can see the numbers there, they're certainly significantly less to date than we're seeing in other parts of the world. But Turkey is unfortunately leading with 153,548 cases as of yesterday. And, but they have seemed to have flattened the curve and we're going to learn in a minute from Professor Dokmeci about what is happening there to flatten that curve. Unfortunately, other countries around the region have failed to flatten the curve at this point, and so we're still seeing rapidly rising cases from India, from Pakistan, there's been a resurgence in Singapore, increasing cases in Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and they're mainly the ones. Most of the other countries around the region seem to have locked down very quickly and introduced social measures to really stop that rapid escalation in cases, and that's very fortunate. But we do have particular regions of particularly countries in the region that we're seeing emergence. I'd also like to show the total number of confirmed COVID-19 deaths. And of course, these are confirmed deaths related to COVID-19 and there may be many other deaths across the region that have not been counted in these statistics. And that's highly likely. Again, we're seeing, we've seen nothing in comparison to other regions of the world, but there are particular areas of concern and particularly there India, Indonesia and Pakistan with increasing number of deaths on a daily basis. Again, we'll learn in a minute that Turkey seems to have lowered their death rate in, in most recent weeks, which is very fortunate. Much of this is dependent on testing, as I've mentioned, and the testing rates around Asia Pacific region are variable. Many countries, we don't actually know the testing rates and other countries have very low testing rates compared to other regions. I'm proud in Australia that we've got one of the highest testing rates in the world in which, but we've got very few cases. So we're doing many, many more tests than we are finding cases. And we're starting to question the cost effectiveness of that. But other regions of the world, particularly Russia, have got very high testing rates, but around Asia Pacific in general, testing rates are low. And therefore, we're going to have real struggle finding out how much disease we actually have before we're seeing the significant impact of the deaths. So with that, thank you very much. And I would like to hand over now to Professor Dokmeci from Turkey to give us insights into what is happening in Turkey of, of recent weeks and months. Okay, thank you very much. present the situation of COVID-19 in Turkey. Next. COVID-19 continues to emerge and represent a serious issue to public health. This virus seems to be very contagious and has quickly spread globally. Since the first outbreak of coronavirus 19 in Wuhan, China, the disease is spreading worldwide. You can see the distribution of COVID-19 cases in different countries. United States is in the top of the list. Turkey is on the ninth place, except United States and Brazil, top seven countries from Europe. I will give you the COVID-19 Turkey for the last 15 days. I'll give you the COVID-19 data in Turkey for the last 15 days. Deaths and active cases are decreasing, though the number of recoveries are increasing. Next, please. 
Turkey has started to take precautions after first case appeared in March 2020. These measures, including restriction for traveling, curfew, closing all restaurants, bars, cafes, shopping and sports centers, were increased and tightened day by day. Also, all domestic and international sports activities were canceled. Next, please. At the beginning, flights were restricted and all domestic and international flights were stopped on April 27 up to June 4 and June 10. Next, please. As you know, when personal protective equipment, such as protective clothing, helmets, gloves, face shields, masks, used properly minimizes the spread of COVID-19 from one person to another. So, at the beginning of this pandemic, the production of health supplies were not enough produced. Many countries has needed those protective equipments. Turkey produced enough amounts and sent them to many countries, including United States. Minister of National Education has started an initiative involving the students and teachers of industrial high schools along the volunteers from all walks of life to ensure the supplies of masks. Next, please. Next, please. Turkey health care system is properly established. Years of conflict in the Syrian Arab Republic have resulted 6.5 million who are internally displaced and over 5.5 million people have sought refuge in neighboring countries of whom more than 3.6 million are in Turkey. Also, Syrian refugees have been taking care of COVID-19 as same as Turkish citizens. Next, please. This is the last diagram. As you can see here, uh, now there is a, the peak is declining. Uh, yesterday, Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Mahrettin Koca declared that uh, the outbreak is under control, but the realities on the virus have not changed. Our home remains the safest environment against the virus. The coronavirus threat has not disappeared yet until by isolation and treatment of the final coronavirus case. The risk continue and losing the control will be an invitation for a second wave. We have seen this in many countries. Yes, this table, data table showing the first case occurred in Turkey 11 March. And uh, uh, after this date, the COVID-19 cases are increasing very, very much. The, uh, as you can see here, the new cases total and active cases. And I can, I can t is show you uh, the yesterday data. Please, next please. Total number of deaths are 4,249. Fortunately, patients in ISU and intubated cases are decreasing. More than 1,000 patients were recovered up to now. Next, please. Ex successful health system, extreme cautions, and strict measures laid basis for low in deaths 
compared to many European countries. The fight against COVID-19 has been most important agenda than in recent months in Turkey. Thank you very much. Next, please. See you happy and healthy without COVID-19. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and I would like to uh, also would like to thank the Apostle COVID-19 Task Force, uh, which is chaired by uh, Professor George Lauz and guided by Professor Chip Sarin to have this uh, uh, episode one of the Apostle COVID-19, which is a series of seven webinars run every week. And today is going to be the last uh, webinars of the first episode of the uh, uh, Apostle COVID-19 webinar. Uh, uh, every uh, Saturday at 4 p.m. Beijing time. To completely wrap up with the episode one, the Apostle COVID-19 on uh, behalf of the Apostle uh, and uh, under the guidance of Professor Sarin, we are pleased to announce the clinical practice guidance for hepatology and liver transplant providers during the, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic which will be available online on the Hepatology International very soon. Please come visit our website at the Apostle to check it out. And, and uh, it's going to be online uh, very soon, uh, I promised. And uh, with this um, you know, uh, the guidance, this is a hard effort of Professor Laos and Professor Sarin to put together uh, all, uh, um, <clears throat> all with the all members of Apostle COVID-19 Task Force. Moreover, since COVID-19 going to be with us for, uh, we don't know for how long, and there are more and more information coming out on behalf of the Apostle and the Apostle COVID-19 Task Force, we are pleased to launch the second episode of Apostle COVID-19, which is going to be the portal where you can update your knowledge and management of COVID-19 in varieties of chronic liver disease. And this is the portal where you can ask the speakers who is going to be invited, uh, not only in the region, but around the world to speak every Saturday. The second episode of our uh, first uh, series of second episodes webinar is going to start on June the 6th, uh, the same time, 4 p.m. Beijing time, so stay tuned and please regularly visit our Apostle website to check it out and follow the Apostle webinar. Uh, with, uh, we, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the tentative uh, program for the sec uh, second episode. So it got to start from June 6th. And with this, I would like to thank all the panelists um, moderators and all of the audience uh, that listen to us uh, today. Stay safe and good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you on June the 6th. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.